all the power, all the glory. Will we trust in his name? He's worthy, isn't he? This is our God that we sing about. What a precious set of songs. Earlier we sang a, another song where we acknowledge that he's a mighty fortress. He's our helper amid the flood. And that was written by Martin Luther in the 1500s. And it was inspired by Psalm 46 that we're going to be looking at today. Psalm 46 was one of his favorites when he needed encouragement and strength in the many trials he faced. It's recorded that in his darkest moments, Luther would say to his friends, come, let us sing the 46th Psalm and let them do their worst. And so we want to find strength and hope as we look together at Psalm 46. Let's look at this, Psalm 46. And this is a song. This is a song. It's such an encouragement. I, there, there's not a passage I've read more next to a hospital bed than, than this psalm. And it's just a, a reminder when the world's coming down who our God is. And we, we can have peace because of who he is. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose stream make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our, ref is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Father, we come before you knowing that you alone are God and the one who sustained us and, and made us for yourselves. All the power, all the glory are yours, so incline our hearts to trust in your name and all your promises that you have for us in Christ Jesus. Bless us this morning as we look to your truth. Sanctify us to make us more like Jesus and to run with hope. We pray in his name, amen. Do you see yourself as weak and needy? Some of our answers probably vary from time to time. Things are sometimes up, sometimes they're down. Often we hear the word needy or, or even weak applied to a person and it's said often with contempt. That person is so needy. They just can't do anything for themselves. You see, being needy often as an undesirable trait, even a character flaw. And so we do whatever we can to avoid feeling weak, or at least appearing weak. So we put on the stiff upper lip and, and we hide our vulnerabilities and we don't open, open up about things with which we struggle. But what if we would recognize weakness and neediness is actually an invitation from God to come rest in him, to find hope and strength in him. Jesus talks about those who are needy. He was speaking to those who thought they were righteous and really didn't need a savior. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I haven't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Oh, we 
He's pointing out how we really all are sinners. We need a physician. You can't really be a Christian without knowing that you're needy of Christ as, as the one who can deal with your sin and who calls us to come to him as the only solution for our great need. So he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. If you don't think that you need rest or you need a burden lifted, then you won't come to Christ, at least not for the right reasons. Our psalm today is for those who are needy. This wasn't something that was sung by those who lived in a world with no problems, but by people who know about struggles. So it begins by talking about a refuge, a shelter, a safe place from trouble and danger. If we consider who needs a refuge, who, who needs help, it's those who, who know that they're in danger or there's potential harm facing them. For those who know that the world is broken and that we're not sufficient on our own, that we have opposing circumstances, those who mourn, who have difficulties from their own failings and from others' failings, and those facing seas of troubles that can overwhelm us. This refuge is for you and for me. If we've understood the nature of a world and life that's marred by sin and death. And it's especially a precious psalm when you find yourself so utterly beyond your strength that you know you need help. Sometimes it takes a a hospital bed or a tragedy to make us realize how much we really need him and how we can come before his throne of grace in those needs. And it's not a character flaw or a problem to recognize that when you face a fierce storm, you need a safe haven. You need accessible help. You you need a refuge. You need the right kind of refuge, of course. Running to the, the wrong one, one that can't actually protect, still leaves you in trouble. But finding the right one that's in this psalm is life and peace. And we can rest in this precious, hope-filled, hope-filled dependence we have on God as our refuge. And so we're going to look at this psalm of trust in God and this God who is, who is with us, who is our protection, who is our peace, and who gives us purpose. And, and that's how we're going to step through this passage, looking at how is God with us. He's with us as our protection, as our peace and our purpose. God is our protection. God is our peace. And God is our purpose. And, and understanding this is what's going to give us the basis for having encouragement, having hope, for turning away from worry and and knowing a peace that that passes all understanding that is a testimony to the world that we have something bigger than just our circumstances in the midst of our trials. And so first we'll start with God is our protection. Maybe you've heard one of the kids around here say to another kid, you're in trouble. And that's what they say to one another when they've done something wrong and they know they're busted and there, there's consequences coming. Now, being in trouble is something that happens to all of us. It can refer to, to harm or consequences that come from all sorts of distresses and difficulties. There's, there's physical distress. We can talk about liver trouble or back trouble. We can have financial trouble. We can have troubles mentally, a troubled mind, a, a troubled marriage, troubles with temptations. We, we live in the midst of social troubles, troubles from wars and enemies and, and politics that can oppose the way we live. And so what this psalmist is talking about at the end of verse 1 is trouble. When you're in trouble, what do you really want? What do you really need? We usually want the trouble to just go away somehow. We look for our circumstances to change. 
We want the sickness to just be gone. We want to have whatever other hardship that's going on just, just to be removed far from us. And, and there's a certain kind of relief, even peace, when that happens, isn't there? But if we're looking to find help in just a change of circumstances, then if the circumstances change for the worse again, we're, we're back in trouble. So what kind of help does the psalmist talk about in Psalm 46? He's talking about finding refuge in trouble, strength in trouble, a very present help in trouble, a refuge. It's a place of protection from trouble, but, but notice it's not necessarily the removal of it. The strength is the ability to withstand the trouble that is there. It's his power put in action for us. And, and the help is, is saying that we're not going through the trouble alone. Notice in all this that the trouble doesn't necessarily go away. Though, though, though it might, but we are girded to endure the trouble. And so we see that. Look at verse 2 there. It's talking about real chaos going on. There's this graphical description of the earth giving away, the mountains falling into the sea. And the earth, if you think about the understanding there, this is, this is something thought to have foundations which are immovable. And the mountains, those are the things, the place where you would take refuge, where you would build a fortress that's stable, it's a dependable place. And here, this dependable mountain is toppled into the depth of the sea. And the sea, that, that is what represented the unknown, the fearful, the tumultuous, the, the unreliable. It was equated with chaos and danger. And so here you have that which is stable being consumed by that which is unstable. As one author says, what people found safety in is being swallowed up by what people fear. What you rely upon is consumed by what you're afraid of. It would be a terrifying thing. These descriptions remind us that in this life there will be times when the things, the things that we think we can count on are just pulled out from under us. That which is calm becomes chaotic. That which was steady crumbles. Has that happened to you? Times when it seems that all earthly support and security and hope is just dashed. The things that we've counted on are no longer trustworthy. It would be such a, a desperate time in those moments, can it? But in those moments, we know our, our weakness. We know our vulnerability in ways we never have before. And so the people of this psalm who sing this song, they know that they have help in the midst of that kind of trouble. And that help is God. God is our refuge and strength and very present help. In the midst of turmoil, whatever it may be, we have a God who will keep us, who will keep his children these three words, refuge and strength and help, it shows the effectiveness and sufficiency of God as being our help. And people who have such confidence in this God can say what it says next. Therefore, we will not fear. The most fearful events are going on, and we have this amazing statement that they don't fear. And how's that happen is because they see that God is bigger than their fears. Pretty important lesson for us. To understand that our greatest good isn't just deliverance from trouble. It's not just a change of circumstances, but it's, it's being brought to find rest and hope in our God to realize our neediness and our dependence upon him who is able. 
See, this is part of how we're made. It's not wrong to feel needy. For example, it's, it's not bad to come to the reality that we're thirsty. We sang earlier, are you thirsty? If we have no water, it's part of our nature to long for water to, to quench our thirst, to satisfy us. That's how we were made. And also, if we are needy in the midst of the troubles and turmoils in life, it's part of our nature to be dependent upon God. That's how we were made also as well. The problem is we go looking everywhere else. Of course you're needy. Of course you were made to rely on our God. We're just not always aware of it, and we suppress the truth that there's a God who wants us to worship and treasure him and find our hope in him, and we exchange worship of the creator for the creation. So in times of turmoil, these can be the very times that bring us to a place where we see God as our only real hope and refuge. And when such trouble drives us to our Lord, to our refuge, one author points out that it fulfills its mission. God does work these things out for making us more like Jesus, for our good. It drives us to rely not on ourselves, but in, in God who can raise the dead. And then we can say, even through tears, that God is enough. God is my strength. God is my help. He will not leave me or forsake me. God is my refuge. Therefore, we will not fear. Even if the world comes crashing down, God is with us. Don't we need to sing this song? Don't we need this to renew our minds day by day, to see the greatness of our Lord. We need to see the trials as opportunities to press into him and his great and, and precious promises. Our greatest good is not just the deliverance from trouble, as we said. It's not just the change of circumstances, but finding rest and hope in a God who brings us beyond this life. And what's this do? It makes us so that we don't have to live like the source of our hope is just improvement of our earthly circumstances. And that's what the world does. That's what I did before I was a Christian. And that's what those did who I hung out with. We, we, we look to improve our income, look to improve our recreation and do more of it, our success, our, our happiness apart from God, apart from anything eternal. Just pursue the fleeting things of life. But isn't it the case that even as Christians, we can get caught up in a similar kind of mindset? Just think about prayer life, for example. So often our prayers are focused on, on improvement of our circumstances. Or how we get this promotion, or deal with the car that's broken, or, or the hip surgery. I had a professor who who taught about trying, trying to do prayer meetings and don't make them just an organ recital. And by organ recital, it means that we pray for our aunt's liver or our neighbor's gallbladder, and we just go through this list over and over again of every body part. In one sense, that's fine. We're to cast our cares upon him. But th that can't be all. That's just what the world Wants. Our requests can't be just about our circumstances. But our, our prayer is to be worship and, and thanksgiving. When our prayers are just about our circumstances and our fears are just about our circumstances and, and our worries are just about our circumstances, about health and finance and job and relationships, if, if those things are dominating our life, one commentator says, then we stop thinking like Christians. We stop praying like Christians because our hope is based on the transformation of our circumstances and not on God. Amen. But if God is our refuge, if he's our treasure, if he's our security, though pandemics come, though jobs disappear, though families become fragmented, though circumstances don't change, God is still with us. And yet we can praise him. 
And then we recognize that, that trouble and loss become the tools to deepen our confidence in his promises. They're used to strengthen our hope and to remind us that this is not our home. Which leads to the next way how God is with us, that God is our peace. What's your picture of peace, peaceful life? Or maybe better, what's your picture of paradise? What's it like? What's the ideal world look like? Maybe some of you are imagining a trip to the tropics on a white sandy beach, sipping out of coconut shells with something in it. Or, or, or maybe it's being in a majestic mountain range in a, a cozy chalet with all the swish chocolate you can imagine. Certainly there's pleasures there in our picture. But on a deeper level, if we really understand what, what our heart longs for in this ideal, is a place of safety and security has all we need, has delights for our body and our soul. We, we long for unhindered love that's not separated by sin and death and corruption. We have a state of mind in which there's no fear. Or what it says in Revelation 21 and the new heaven and new earth, when the end comes, there'll be no more death. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. But most importantly, at the center of that picture in Revelation 21, verse 3, is this. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. The center of paradise will be with God. Like in Genesis, and the Garden of Eden, and in paradise, we will have fellowship with him and his kingdom. And so if we really understand where history is going, where we are going if we are God's children, is to have eternal life with him. And so Jesus comes in John 17, 3, and he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Jesus is the only way into this kingdom, into this paradise Eden with our maker. And so in the book of Revelation, the kingdom picture continues. At the center, as we read earlier in Revelation 22, there is a river in a city flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who, who died for our sin, who was the substitute. And this is a river of the water of life. And there's nothing accursed there. Righteousness dwells, and we will see our Lord face to face. This is the picture of the paradise you were made for. And so back to our psalm, we also read of a city the psalmist takes us from the waters that can destroy and overwhelm everything that we might think is reliable in verses 2 and 3, the waters that can bring devastation, and he leads us to water that gives life and nourishes and brings delight. Verse 4, Psalm 46, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation, the, the dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. God is in the midst of her, and it's a picture of us being in the midst of the city with God. Now, some people think this city is Jerusalem, or, or Zion, as it's sometime called, but, but Jerusalem never had a river in the city itself. And so we see this as a picture of the ultimate Zion, the one that scriptures look forward to. The river, first of all, it's an echo of the river that flows from the Garden of Eden in Genesis and, and, and feeds the nations. It's also 
a, a picture of the river that's in Ezekiel 47 where there's these flowing stream that, that comes out of the house of God, out to the nations that provides life for the barren desert and sweetens the waters of the Dead Sea. Ezekiel 37 is giving a picture of paradise regained. And so all these pictures are pointers to the, the city of Revelation where the river gives life. This river, this water, it's a picture of vitality, of blessing and, and restoration that comes from God, provision from God and in the presence of God. Even as in the Old Testament talks in Jeremiah 2.13 that, that God is pictured, he is living water. And even as Jesus in the New Testament speaks in the Gospel of John that he is the water that gives life. And this water brings joy. It makes glad the city of God. It delights the city. This making glad is the same word used in the picture that, that Jeremiah 31 has where there's the promise of the new covenant where, where God will make things right. Where he says, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. He will give gladness. So not only is God our protection, he is also our pleasure. He will not only strengthen you, he will satisfy you. Even if the world gives way in this life. So again, we can, we can live in this world with this hope and we can see the, the pain and the loss as a reminder that only God can make us glad and one day he will. And that can give us a certain joy even now. As we fix our hope on the grace that's coming to us, we can be strengthened for our trials now. We can have some of the gladness now. And so Jesus can say in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 4, Blessed, happy are those who mourn. They are happy now as they mourn because they shall be comforted. See, that's part of God being our peace. It's a glad peace. A thirst-quenching, satisfying peace. And having that is what keeps us walking in hope now. It makes our obedience a happy choice. It gives us a peace that, that passes understanding in our circumstances. It, it keeps us enthralled with his grace that we should be called children of God. And it makes us merciful. It allows us to kill sin. It allows us to love because we've been loved. And so the first part of God being our peace is that God is our pleasure. And secondly, another part of God being our peace is that God is powerful. Having something good is one thing, keeping it's another, isn't it? So many things we have that we enjoy don't last. The grave always takes it away, unless it's something that transcends the grave. And there are all sorts of things around, our circumstances which might take away our joy. Our ancient foe seek to work us woe, we sang earlier. He wants to undo us. But here's what we need to know to have peace, is that it's secure. Our peace is secure because of God's power to bring peace and keep peace. Notice verse five, the city shall not be moved. This is a contrast. Notice, verse 2, it talked about the mountains, which we, we might rely upon. They will be moved. They could be moved. But God's city, his people, will not be moved. They will not be taken away. Verse 6, nobody can oppose him and win. The nations rage. They're rebelling against God and his ways. Think of Psalm 2, where it talks about the nations who rage and the kings that set themselves against the Lord and his anointment, anointed. They just rage, and, and the kingdoms may totter. They may fail. But all God needs to do, verse 6, is to utter his voice against these nations that rage, and the earth melts. The same power that spoke 
the world into existence can speak the nations out of existence and speak that which is against you out of existence. Any threats from the enemy will not succeed ultimately. In fact, we've seen that power demonstrated again and again in history. Think of the Exodus, the deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt with the miracles and the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, the defeating of the Egyptians. Think of the times of conquest going into the promised lands and times when the enemies are scattered and, and, and through the judges and kings even. The, there are stories when God's people didn't even lift a finger, yet they pillaged the enemy. And so, verse 8, we have the command not to seek to deliver yourself, not, not, not even to not worry, but contemplate God's deliverance. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Look at his works. Look at his power. Look what he's done. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. Look at what he's done. Fill your mind with the understanding of God's power to overcome all that is opposing you. That's the basis for comfort and not fearing, is understanding that God is with us and for us, and he is able to sustain us. He is able to bring about his promises. And he is able to remove the scourges that wreak havoc in our lives. Historically, think about what, what's one of the biggest plights on humanity? What causes the, the greatest devastation in history? It's war. If it's not war among nations, there are wars within nations. Even ours, politically and ideologically, there's wars going on. There are wars, quarrels, even within our families. And what we understand is the source of war is, is not just our outward circumstances, but as James 4 says, it's in human nature. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? That your desires are at war within you? you know, wars and fights, it comes from hearts that need deliverance from sinful ways. You need to be delivered for putting our hope in other things. For worshiping, as we said earlier, the creation instead of the creator. And only God can stop it. Verses 8 through 10, the psalmist portrays the establishment of, of universal peace through God's power. You understand that, that the Lord's plan for mankind is to bring about the end of wars and bring in the era of peace, of paradise. He will judge the nations and those who are opposed, and he will deliver his people into his city where we are made glad in him. And so we see the instruments of warfare symbolized here by the bow and the spears, the shields. They're, they're going to be done. They're going to be ineffective. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. In other words, nothing is a match for him. And so here's what we need to do in light of all this, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Or some translations say, cease, cease striving and recognize that I'm God. This is a command. Cease, cease your striving. This is the Lord speaking here now. He, he speaks not to just say to us, oh, sit back, relax, meditate. Not first, be, be still is a, a rebuke before it's a comfort. Be still and know that I am God and you are not. So to the nations, what's that mean? Cease raging against me and think you can win. Psalm 2 again. The kings say, let us burst the Lord and his anointed's bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. and The Lord holds them in derision. You cannot succeed Cease striving, bow the knee, kiss the sun. Find blessing in him alone. But to his people, he also says, cease striving. 
Stop striving to find peace in other places. Stop fretting over things you can't control. Stop acting as if you can have your way all the time and predict the future. Stop your fears. Know that I am God, that I am in charge, that I am your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It's like in Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret yourself over the one who prospers in his way or the man who carries out evil desires. Don't be looking to what the world hopes in. Look at me. Wait for me. And so while be still has a negative side of stopping, stopping something, being still is also an opportunity. It's a call to stop doing one thing in favor of something else. And so what is the, the something else that we're putting on? We're not just putting off our, our striving, but we're putting on what it says next, a knowing that I'm God. In your life, reflect on what it means for God to be God. Reflect on his power. Look at what he's done. Look what he can do. Don't fear. He even cares for the sparrows. How much more can he care for you? He knows every hair on your head. So you can entrust yourself to him. We need to put him and his goodness and his promises and hope at the center of our thinking. You've heard it said, what, what controls our thinking controls us. Earlier we are talking about what, what dominates our thinking. And what dominates our thinking will seem large in our lives, in our minds. And if our fears are, are largely what we think about, then those problems, those troubles will seem big and God will seem small. And so I found this question helpful. Do you dwell more on God or more on your troubles? Do you think more about your circumstances or more about the God who controls your circumstances? It's so easy to let the troubles around us just spin our thinking down and worry about what we're going to do and how to respond with those and get into despair. But here's a command we need is to... Stop thinking about that and start thinking more about who our God is, his promises, that he will never leave us and forsake us, that he will give us a way through temptation to endure, that he will work these things for good. He will make us like Jesus. He will give us exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can think or ask. He will be with us. Now, how you answer that question probably is an indication of how much you either fear or have peace dominate your life. You see, being still isn't always a help. Being still can make our fears actually louder. It can make our souls shrivel and despair. It can make God feel distant unless we fill our time of being still with the knowledge of God with the awesome reality of God's supremacy in the world and over the world and his certain victory over the brokenness of this world, that won't hit us, it won't shape us unless we become still before him and let those truths take deep root into our hearts and our hopes. So it's no surprise when we have fear and turmoil when we don't do that. So again, verse 10 is the call to stop our mind from dwelling on fears and meditate on the greatness of God, his power, his peace, and finally, his purpose. How God is with us is that we need to understand that God is our purpose. It's a common question that we have throughout the ages. What, what's the meaning of life? Or what's my purpose? If probably ask yourself that question. You can go ahead and ask Google that question too and look at some of the answers. <laughs> You'll see stuff like the, the meaning of life is that which we choose to give it. 
whatever that means. Kind of, if it works for you, if it's good for you, great type of thing. What's that do? It just puts us at the center of the universe. And it functionally denies that we were created by a creator for a purpose. And God didn't create you as an end in yourself. Our meaning consists of understanding our purpose from our maker. And our peace and, and, and our hope is understanding that in this world with all its ugliness and beauty, as one author says, all the gladness and groaning, pleasure and pain, we can know that God's children have a wise, good, and satisfying purpose. Some of you know the old catechism question, what is the chief end of man? To glorify him and enjoy him forever. Glorify and enjoy. Part of the same end. This is the purpose for which we were made. And glorify, God is glorious. So what's it mean to glorify him is that somehow we acknowledge and treasure and reflect his glory in how we live our lives. We reflect his greatness. You see, we were created in his image uniquely so that we can reflect something about his greatness. And the commentator says, why did God create man to show God? How can purpose, fulfillment, and satisfaction in life be found is by living according to our created design. The catechism is just a summary of what the Bible says in so many different ways. We glorify God by living in a way that shows how valuable God is, by finding your joy and your hope in him, by, by finding him as our all-sufficient refuge and strength, is the one who can help us and, and know that he is God. So we go back to this picture of paradise with God at the center. Our purpose is to live like dwelling with God in all our fullness and in all his perfections is more precious than even our trials. And we wouldn't trade it for anything. His worth needs to grab our heart, even if all the pleasures in this life are taken away. It's like Jesus taught in Matthew 13, 44. He says, the kingdom of heaven, this, this kingdom, this paradise with God at the center is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and in his joy he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. He gave up everything else, every other pleasure to have the kingdom of God, and he says, this is a good deal. So why not fret or, or, or worry or have fear? Right? Bad stuff can really happen to us. Why not? Because we have something bigger than our fears. That's God. Paradise with him is bigger. Being with our maker forever is better. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Or Psalm 73, verse 25, there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Verse 28, but for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. And so the psalmist encourages us. Look again, verse 10. Be still, know that I am God. And it goes on. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. He said, I will accomplish my purposes. I am the greatest power. I am your greatest protection, your greatest pleasure. He will show himself supremely valuable and supremely worthy of your dependence on him of being the all-sufficient strength. Nothing compares to me. And he will be exalted, and that is what his people will see him as, as worthy. And when we see him as all of that, that gives him glory. And it gives us joy and peace as we depend upon him. These facts are, are central to the believer's trust and ability to have peace in the trials of life. 
How else? How else can we have peace unless there's something bigger? It's because we know that he is God and we are satisfied in him. Do you find him that worthy? There's our battle, isn't it? There's so many lesser lights we sang about earlier that can take us away from seeing his worth. But here's the thing, in this battle we need to remember that we're not alone if we're truly his children, if we've truly entrusted ourselves to Jesus Christ, we've had faith in him, we've come to recognize our need for our sin to be paid for and removed, and we've come to rest in him alone, not only for his forgiveness, but for his promises. See, part of his purpose is that he intends to be with us, to dwell with us, to have him as our God, and we as his people. And that's not just in the new heaven and new earth, not just in Revelation, but now. Notice the proclamation of the psalmist, those who sing this song. The God is for us. He is with us. God is our refuge. They sing, he's mine, he's ours. And that that sense in verse 1 is similar to the refrain in verse 7 and 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A mighty fortress is our God, the Lord of hosts, the, the, the armies of heaven. He is with us and he is able to bring about everything in his plan and his purposes. And we have his presence with us now. When trials come, when no one else is around, we need to know we're not alone when we're isolated in that hospital bed and no one's allowed in or we're sick somewhere on a trip. I remember one time I was so sick traveling. It's just hard, isn't it? There's so many bigger hardships. You can feel desolations and, and loneliness. Don't know where to turn, but God is with you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you, Hebrews 13. And so when Jesus came, who, who the Bible reveals as Emmanuel, God with us, he says, lo, I am with you always. He will not leave us or forsake us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God and him. And he would come to us. He won't leave us alone. He gives us his spirit with us and in us. And all who have put their faith or reliance in him and have found him as the only refuge from sin, the only hope for eternal life, who have come to him weak and needy, have found grace in him, have this promise. That his plan is to be with us. So don't let the troubles of life distract you from these truths and rob you of this peace Don't lose sight of God's purposes for you to be with him forever. Don't lose confidence in his power, which is able to bring it all to reality. Draw near. Draw near to his word, to him in prayer, to the church, to to one another, to encourage each other day by day. Be still. Take the time to know that he is God. Take the time to, to sing these songs, to meditate on his grace to meditate on his goodness. And then we can cease striving. And we can have a peace because God is with us. So Father, help us to be those who know how much you've set before us. Make our trusting in you based on who you really are, not just wishful thinking. Give us hearts that are inclined to long for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as is in heaven, starting even with our own lives, knowing that you are not far, you are near, you are with us, you care for us. Lord, we know that glorious things of you are spoken. Make them our own 
God, you are our God. Let us trust you and not be shaken. Renew a steadfast spirit within us to rest in you alone. We pray because of Christ in whom we have the way, the truth, and the life, the forgiveness, the life, the satisfaction. Amen.